Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. My name is Richard Furr, and I can say I am cloud hired. That yes, come and join and get cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Hey, go, go cloud architect family. I'm cloud hired. Well, I'm cloud hired, guys. So I'll just say I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired thanks to go cloud the architects. It worked for me, and now I'm cloud hired. Because because of Google Architect program, I am cloud hired. See! I am cloud hired. Thank you, Mike and the Glow Cloud team. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another cloud computing career Q and A session from us here at Go Cloud Careers. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. 
I'm joined by Mike Gibbs, our founder and CEO, and Alonzo Coleman, our chief marketing officer. So before we get started, I just want to give you a little breakdown about what we're doing here. So we're here to help you build your best technology career. Sorry, my nose itches at the exact wrong time. So we're here to help you build your best technology career. The team here between the three of us on this call has over 50 years of leadership experience, and we're here to help you. As I said, I've got Mike, our founder and CEO. He's been in tech for 25 years and has held elite architect positions for over two decades as a network architect, enterprise architect, cloud architect, and a business architect. And then, of course, we've got me. I've got 15 years of HR and corporate leadership experience, and I'm the chief operating officer here at GoCloud Careers, as I mentioned earlier. And just like Mike, I'm here to share my wealth of experience with you as well. And of course, Alonzo, Chief Marketing Officer, is an expert in marketing, branding, strategy, and leadership. He has 30 years of marketing experience with major global organizations, and he's led many major cloud projects. He helps our students build elite brands that in most cases, our students don't even need to apply for jobs because the world comes to them. As I said earlier, we're here to help you. We all hold MBAs. We all have skills from an extensive careers to help you not only get hired, but put you on your path to long-term career success. And today we're gonna be here for an hour, maybe a little longer to take your questions about cloud computing careers, cloud architect careers, uh, cloud engineer careers, anything about the uh, cloud computing jobs or cloud computing training, whether it's the cloud engineer versus the cloud architect, cloud architect versus the cloud solution architect, uh, what do I need to be an Azure cloud computing specialist? What do I need to be to be an Azure, uh, AWS cloud computing specialist? Anything about cloud computing, cloud architect, and cloud jobs, we're going to be here to answer those questions for you. So I want to point out, Mike has helped so many people build such great careers and earn so much in tech, and mm -hmm. he's built such a great reputation that it costs $1,200 an hour to speak with him in a private one-on-one -on -one session but we're here for free and it's not just mike it's all three of us we're here for free right. to take your questions for an hour at least so don't 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 be shy ask us your questions it usually it never fails it takes like five or ten minutes for for people to start asking questions and by that time we've already we're already 15 percent of the way through so ask your questions don't hesitate we're here to help you we're here to take your questions Put them in the chat box. I don't see any questions yet. So um, is, is there a link for the Cloud Computing Career Training Q&A? This is the Cloud Computing Career Training Q&A. So you are where you need to be, Varun. So if you've got a question, ask the question. Anybody's got a question, ask a question. Mike, Alonzo, you want to say anything? Uh, sorry, sorry. I get excited. I, get, I, I start talking and talking and I don't stop. Turn it into Mike here. So. <laughs> I love that, Chris. And I'm excited too. You know, we have a student on our course. He's been with us for about two weeks. He put down Go Cloud Careers on his resume. He started to work on his resume according to our branding section. And he says, Mike, what do I do? This recruiter wants to bring me on for this job, but I'm not ready yet. Should I go on an interview? Should I not go on an interview? And I said to him, you know, don't go on an interview until you're ready. It's like don't fly an airplane unless you're a pilot because nothing good's going to happen. If you go in an interview before you're ready, you can damage your reputation. You won't get hired in that company. And, you know, it's going to psych you out. Don't use it as interview practice. You know, practice the interview the right way and win that interview. In fact, you know, I've been well, every, every interview except for one in my entire career I got hired on because I was prepared for the interview. So preparation is key. Um, so that's the key. But to me, it's exciting that my students get literally speaking bombarded with recruiters that most of them never even need to apply. So it's that. So my point is to you, all of you, you can do anything you want. There's no career you can have. All you have to do is get the right training, the proper education, learn all the skills that are critical for the job. And I'm going to tell you whatever the job is, certifications are like no more than three to 5% of those skills, any yeah. job in fact. Go change and make sure you've got the right soft skills, energy, enthusiasm, passion, emotional intelligence, sales skills, and interview skills, and you can get any role you want, regardless of your background, regardless of your education, and regardless of your experience. So believe in yourselves. You can all do it. I've watched it happen. 
I've been doing it myself for 20 some years, including my transition from internal medicine to tech. And no, I didn't start at the bottom. I started as a network engineer for, which was four levels above the people that I was actually working with when I had zero experience. So the point is, you can all do it and all do what you want. Remember, believe in yourself, go after it, and you can conquer anything. Alonzo, let's go to you. Well, Mike, you said everything, and, and Chris has, has really, you all have, have really put in point to what we do on a daily basis. And what I want to impart to everyone is that you ever had that feeling that you did complete um, any certifications and yet you still have that tinge of imposter syndrome? Well, that's because your training is incomplete. What we do right here is that we encompass, start from the ground up, regardless of your background, give you that solid cloud knowledge, CXO relevancy, soft skills, emotional intelligence, create that sense and skill of you being able to present wonderful architecture that you set, you yourself are full in full understanding of, and we're able to package that into a unique perspective that all hiring managers are looking for. So we're here for you and we're ready to answer your questions. All right. So before we get there, uh, I see people heeded my call. We've got some questions that rolled in. So Can't before we get to that, I want to I want to make uh, everyone aware of uh, just a couple of things. So we do have our uh, free "How to Get Your First Cloud Job" webinar that we do on Thursday. You can uh, register for that at the link in the description. And I believe a member of our team is also going to be putting that in the uh, in the uh, chat box as well. So make sure to register for that. You'll be able to uh, come and hear our presentation about what exactly you need to do to become the ultimate cloud architect, how to deal with the crazy job descriptions, how to deal with HR, what hiring managers actually want, all that good stuff. Um, and I know, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, hear it multiple times and, and listen multiple times and then go out and try and figure it out and then come back and say, okay, yeah, this is right six months later. Um, but we, 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 we try to give you the, the right picture up front so that you can uh, save yourself time, effort, and energy. So make sure to register for that in the, uh, in the link in the description. And also, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of our uh, free AWS exam guide. There is, uh, you can get that at the link in the description, and there'll be a link in the chat box for that as well. Uh, that is free completely to you. That is a free AWS exam guide. That's a free AWS video course, free AWS lab demos, all to help you on your way to your AWS Cloud Architect, Certified Solution Architect. Sorry, I forget what the names of these uh, certifications are these days, but uh, that's to help you for free uh, on, your, on your certification path. So make sure to take advantage of that. We provide that to you for free so that so that you don't have to spend your money on on the bare minimum the base base level uh expectation of of everyone so let me get that link in the uh, chat box as well um here we go and then we'll get to the questions and thanks for putting that link in there chris you know no one's ever going to get hired by just having an aws certified solution architect associate or professional and that's why we give it away for free because it will help you get an interview, but it won't get you get hired. And I don't want to see anybody pay for something that's not going to get them hired, not going to raise their salary, and not going to build them an elite career. So we give that away for free to help all of you guys. And let me tell you, 150 people worked on that from various technology backgrounds and hundreds of years of experience to help you. So please download it. It's free. Yep. All right. So let's go. Uh, first question is going to be uh, from... Where did it go? I just had it pulled up. All right. From Ott. How can one without tech knowledge start a career in cloud architect? Ott, I'm going to give you the short answer. I'll give you some more information. And then uh, I want you to attend a webinar. So Ott, please attend our How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar on uh, Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, which is 6 p.m. UK time. Now, uh, and I've got example after example after example of people that do it with us all the time. Romanik Ivan Tambo was working as a waiter before he got hired by AWS. Uh, Coyote was working as a waiter before he got hired. No, he was working as a college student before he got hired by AWS. 
Vladimir got hired uh, fresh out of college. Delroy Bat was an EMT with no tech experience. And, and we can put some testimonials for you to see it because I want you to see it for yourself. Jennifer was a mental health tech before she got hired as a solution architect. Jeffrey West was doing some kind of weird geo space with geothermal imaging of the earth, completely unrelated, and he got hired. Bowwinder was a stay-at-home mom, and she got her first job. So the key to this first is OT is knowing what the architect job is and avoiding the dangerous guidance. So the thing is, as an architect, we design, present, and sell a technology solution, but our focus is on improving the customer's business performance. As architects, we do not ever touch the technology. We don't code, we don't configure, we don't do sysops, we don't do devops, and if that stuff's littered on your resume, I'm gonna tell you right now, you'll never get hired because somebody's gonna see you, I hate to use the term as a tech nerd, as opposed to a business solution provider. So there's that. Now, the reason certifications can't get you hired is they teach the name of a service and how to configure that service, but architects design, present, and sell. So I'm going to tell you the underlying technologies, and then I'm going to tell you the business things. What we do as architects is we move the stuff, which my mother-in-law likes to call things. English is her second language, but she's brilliant. And uh, we move the stuff from the network and data center to the cloud. And what is all clouds? They're just virtual network and data centers. So this means you need to know the following and learn the following technologies. And we teach all of this in our, in our cloud architect program, both the elite program and our cloud architect career development program. And this is why our students get hired every day. You need to learn the underlying network first because nothing works without the network, which means IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, route summarization, route aggregation, WAN technologies, which includes IPsec VPNs, SSL VPNs, private lines, software-defined networking, Ethernet over MPLS, and SASE, of course. It involves knowing routing protocols such as BGP and OSPF, because you will have to interrogate with protocols like OSPF as well as BGP. It involves understanding switching, which means VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking. Sport spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, 802.1Q tagging, um, things to that effect, port channel, ether channel, and link aggregation groups. It involves a lot of knowledge of ARP and DNS and DHCP and proxy ARP and NAT. And NAT is not just going to the internet, it's one-to-one -one NAT, one-to-many NAT, static NAT, dynamic NAT, PAT. Now, we teach all of this. If you don't take our course, that's 10,000 pages of reading minimum just to understand that. Now, Because you can't design what you don't understand. As architects, we don't touch the tech, but we need to know how the tech works. Now, the next thing you need to know is the data center tech. And that means servers and server virtualization and containers and container orchestration, storage area networks, block storage, object storage, file storage, load balancers, when to use network load balancers, when to use application load balancers, when to stack your load balancers, where to reverse proxies come into play, where to API gateways, because that falls under the same kind of logic. Next, you need to know databases. And we're not going to be using the proprietary stuff in a multi-cloud environment. So you need to understand how relational databases work and NoSQL databases and data warehouses. You need to understand how data lakes are created with the right the way they're done and created. After that, you should have some knowledge of machine learning, not that much, but at least a little bit. Then you need to understand the business applications, which include business, which include uh, unifying communications, CRM, ERP systems. And then you need to understand real security, things like uh, next generation firewalls, IDS, IPS, and some VP concentrators. Now remember, OT, that's just a tech, but most of our job is not tech. Most of our job is digital transformation. So the next thing that we need to do, and we can go a little later, Chris, today, because today I had a meeting that was canceled. So I know I'm spending some time on this because it's a pretty important question. So next, what you need to understand is since we design, present, and sell, you need to know the following. You need to know what the CEO, CFO, CIO, and CTO care about. It's called CXO relevancy. And if you're not with us, you can take a course. I spent, well, I should say Cisco paid about 20, ten dollars to $20,000 for me to learn these things. Next, you need to understand business acumen. And business acumen is you know, how to read a financial statement, how to read a balance sheet, how, to, how does a business work and operate. So you're going to need training. Either get it with us, get an MBA. I don't care. Just I want you to get hired. Now, after that, you have to understand as an architect, you're never going to design something yourself. You're going to go build a team. So you're going to need strong leadership skills. Now, in order to lead people, you're going to need good soft skills, good communication skills, and good executive presence. So you're going to have to develop those skills as well. Now, you're going to have to develop executive writing skills and a lot of sales skills, everything from selling your manager into giving you other resources and selling your clients, and you're also going to need negotiation skills. 
That's what we put in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program and our Elite Cloud Architect Program. And we'll tell you more about how you can do it with us or on your own on Thursday's webinar. But that's why we get our people hired every day. That's why our training is over 500 hours in length. And that's why we say certifications are not enough because they don't even scratch the surface of these things. OT, I hope I've answered your question. I'm happy to answer subsequent questions for you. All right, so I'm going to go a little out of order here because okay. I saw this uh, question come in. Uh, Love it. And then we'll get back in order. And I'm going to I'm going to put you on the big screen because I know we were talking about this the other day, and I know you want to. You got some thoughts about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, that's me. <laughs> so Rock and Rolla says, "Can you talk about the associate solution architect role?" Rock and Rolla, I love talking about these roles, and here's the reason: I have mentored more. Associate solution architects, associate account managers, and associate systems engineers for decades. And here's the key. If you know what to do, if you're lucky enough to get one of these roles, you're going to have a great career. But if you do it the wrong way, you'll be fired within 18 months to two years. So this is a very specific role. The associate solutions architect role is a training role. It's not a role for a real architect. It's a training role. And here's what happens organizations hire some of the best and brightest people out there. They look for smart people that have good GPAs in school that are highly motivated, and they hire them in a paid training environment, meaning they bring these people in and they train them to actually be an architect. So typically the training lasts six months to 12 months. If somebody's there for more than 12 months, say 18 months, they're gonna be fired at the next layoff, and it's time for them to look for another job at another company or get another career. So the key is how to be successful really quickly. So when you have these roles, here's how I advise my associate solution architect, associate sales engineers, and associate account managers. First principle is you don't know anything yet. You're there as a trainee. So you have to remember you don't know what you don't know. So here's what you need to do. You need to find a great mentor. Now, you can't just ask anybody to be your mentor because you don't want to ask somebody else that doesn't know what they don't know. So I recommend you look for the following. You look for a distinguished architect, a principal architect, or someone that's director level that manages architect. And here's the reason. They've already made it. They're already successful, and they can guide you to these elite roles because they've done it. You don't want to ask someone that's struggling to get there themselves. You want to ask people that know. Now, to rock and roll, here's the thing. You have to understand that since this is a trainee role, and you have to get out of that trainee role pretty fast, you're gonna have to become great. So how do you become great? Well, you're gonna be training at work for a fair period of time. And when you get home, make sure you do the following. Don't waste your time on social media because it's gonna eat up your time. Don't watch TV. Dedicate one to three hours on really learning and studying and being the best you possibly can be. Because remember, if you don't get out of this role, you're gonna be fired and you don't want that. But if you do it right, this career is going to be like a rocket ship and get you there. So go home and practice. Now, three, pick something you truly love and start to specialize in that. So maybe you love security, get extra good on that. Maybe you love the banking industry, get extra good at that. Or maybe you like the business side of tech, so develop yourself there. Lastly, please do yourself and everybody else a favor. Refrain from giving guidance to anybody. Remember, you're a trainee. You don't know what you know or know what you don't know. And you can't, as a trainee, give guidance to others because here's the thing. You haven't made it yet. You haven't gotten out of the trainee role. So make sure that you protect others. You know, in medicine, we have the Hippocratic Oath that says do no harm. Well, it's the same thing. Don't advise others until you've already made it yourself because you want to make sure people are successful. Now, I've used these techniques for decades helping associate solutions architects, associate uh, sales executives, and associate systems engineers, otherwise sales engineers, build incredible careers and get out of these positions in as little as six months into great, high paying, wonderful architect roles, wonderful engineer roles, and wonderful account manager or account executive roles. So rock and roll, that's what I would do. That's how you'd be successful in this role. All right, so let's get to the next question. All right. Um, so 
Minot says, don't you think it's better to be good at one cloud provider before you start learning another cloud platform? Learning all at the same time makes uh, takes time and will definitely slow you. Exactly. Yes, it will be definitely it will definitely be very slow. It will actually be very repetitive and it will be the exact same thing three different times. Yes. Or four exactly. times or five yes. times. Even even Trevor Spires, a well-known uh, face over at AWS, made a post just a, just the other day saying, "Don't do that. You're learning the same thing three times. If you try to if you try to learn AWS, Azure, and GCP, it's literally the same thing three times. Don't do that. What we uh, promote or advocate for is learning the cloud. Don't learn AWS. Don't learn Azure." Don't learn GCP. I mean, some people, I understand it's easier if you wrap it in something like AWS. But if you do it, know, hey, all of this is applicable for Azure and GCP. I just need to know what their names are. It's the same stuff over and over again. So learn the cloud. Don't learn this cloud, that cloud, that cloud. It's just, I say this every time, it's like driving. You don't learn to drive one car. Right. Or one truck, unless it's an 18 wheeler, then, then it's different. But you don't learn to drive a Toyota sedan, a Mercedes sedan, a Ford sedan. You learn how to drive a car, and then you can drive any car. You use any steering wheel, you use any any gas and any brake and any clutch. You know, if you still you still driving the driving the uh, gear the stick shifts, but you learn how to drive just like riding a bike. You learn how to ride a bike. You don't learn how to ride a Schwinn or a or a Huffy or a Mongoose. Um, you can definitely tell I'm a kid of the '90s, but um, with those names. But you learn how to ride a bike, so it's the same with the cloud. Don't learn. Don't do either one of these. Don't learn them all at the same time, and don't learn them one at a time either. It, that is, it, it's either going to be a lot of confusion trying to learn them all at once or it's going to be repetitive and potential lost earnings because you're learning the same stuff a second time and then you're learning the same stuff a third time yeah. and you're learning the same stuff however many times you want to do it there's more than three there's right. four there's five there's 18. um so that's my two cents on this question. I think that was a little more than two cents, but I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts yeah. because this is a dangerous concept that's out there. Yeah, like the, the multi-cloud, this is the this is the dark side of the multi-cloud. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but and there's a huge caveat here. You can't learn the cloud by getting AWS certified or yeah, Apple no, no, certified no. or Google yeah. certified. You yeah. must learn the cloud. So if you learn the cloud, you know all. But if all you learn is AWS or just Azure or just Google, right. you won't be able to work for them or know anything about the cloud. So here's the thing. You have to learn the underlying technology that makes the cloud. Because whether you're working with a private cloud like Nutanix or OpenStack or a public cloud like Alibaba or Google Cloud or Azure or AWS, Oracle or any other cloud, you have to remember they're all the same. If you got to buy a brick, it doesn't matter which hardware store is, but you need to know you need a brick. Right. So what we're talking about really is knowing this. You must know the network and you must know the data center. If you truly understand how virtualization and hypervisors work, for real, that's learning the cloud. Guess what? Whether it's a VMware virtual machine, an Oracle virtual machine, an Azure virtual machine, an AWS EC2 instance, or a Google Compute Engine instance, it's the same. But if you don't know what a virtual machine is and you just learn EC2 and how to configure them, you know, guess what? You know nothing because you don't know what the underlying technology is. And that's the thing about these certifications. It's the name of a service without telling you what it is and how to configure that service. So it's almost worthless. Same thing for a container. If you learn Docker and Kubernetes, guess what? You know that on all clouds, regardless of the name. Now, if you understand what a load balancer is, for real. It doesn't matter if it's an FI load balancer in the cloud, a Google Cloud load balancer, an Azure load balancer, or an AWS Elastic load balancer. It's the same. So when we say learn the cloud, we're effectively telling you to learn one cloud, but it's really the it's all clouds at the same time. Right. 
But you can't learn anything with the certification because here's the thing. If we're dealing with architects, we're dealing with system designers. And you don't learn system design by configuring. I mean, think about it. Imagine you have an airplane mechanic, and then you ask them to fly the airplane. They can't do it. They know how to fix an engine, but they don't know how to fly the plane. And, you know, I've taught paramedics, and I was a paramedic, which was really cool. We had a list of, like, 50 things that we could do in our 500 hours of paramedic training. And if the person had this, we did this. If the person had this, we did this. And guess what? When I started practicing internal medicine, and then it was like the first person came in with their headache, I was like, wait, <laughs> this is not like being a paramedic where I've got three choices on the menu. This could be one of 100 conditions that I need to know. So the key is learn the cloud menu. Not learn a certification. Learn the cloud. But don't waste your time trying to learn Google's silly names and Azure's silly names and AWS's mm -hmm. silly names because in the end, you're going to have this mixed up head full of skinny names. Crazy <laughs> and the names are going to change in three years anyway. Right. The names will change when the marketing, All the marketing names. is better. So, and you know, how do you actually design an architecture? You meet with the client. You ask what their people are going on. You build your team. You determine the optimal end state. Then you figure out the technology. That they're in, and it's like, oh, I need a thousand virtual machines. Oh, we're going to put this on AWS. I mean, a thousand EC2 instances. Oh, we're on Google. We need a thousand QPA engine instances. So we design it with the tech. And when you talk to your customers, guess what? You can't talk about those silly marketing buzzwords either because they'll kick you out of the room because you don't look like a trusted advisor. You look like you got an initiative. So great question, Mano. All right. Not a cloud, not a cloud provider. Right. Yep. Um, follow up from Mano, and I'll put a link to the video. I've seen a lot of jobs requiring cloud architect to show to know at least Python, <laughs> K8s, and Linux, most of the t most uh, most of them. What do you think? I'll kick this one off again. I mean, yeah. I see, you see job descriptions that want more years of experience in Kubernetes than Kubernetes has been around. I was mm -hmm. I was on LinkedIn the other day and I saw uh, it, it's a meme, but it's a meme that was made because somebody posted this. The creator of a programming language, or no, the creator of Fast API came across a job description that said that there that it required X number of years of fast API. And he shared it and said, I guess I don't qualify because I hadn't created it that far back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, these job descriptions yeah. may say they want this stuff, but it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's a jumbled mess of, of just everybody's wish list of 15 different departments. It, it, it's just like, we talk about how we copy, how hiring managers will copy and paste jobs. <laughs> That's what we do. Stuff. But the best scenario of that is that they copy and paste jobs from the same roles. The most likely case is that they're going to copy and paste jobs that are completely irrelevant because that's what they found in the 15 minutes they had to create their job description. So it, you're going to get such crazy job descriptions. And then they, and then they give them to HR and HR makes them all look pretty and unified and formatted properly. But the, yeah. the junk is still in there. Mm -hmm. so. And we have to actually look at one other component of this. Most of this cutting and pasting comes from the word solution architect. And here's the thing. A solution architect could be one of 10,000 jobs. Yep. If I go to the local carpet store, they have solution architects that are there that help me determine my carpet and hardwood styles. AT&T, when you used to walk into their stores, they used to have a solution architect. You know what they did? Determine which cell phone plan you used to be on. Now, if you are at Oracle as a database solution architect, guess what? You're going to have all this database stuff that's in there as part of your job title. And then there's that. So if you're a solution architect at a software company, guess what? You're going to have some of that. And if you're a solution architect at HP OpenShift, I'm sorry, not, or not HP OpenShift, at Red Hat OpenShift, you're going to have all kinds of Kubernetes. So how do we make, make job descriptions? What we all do is we go and cook, cook five of them. Hey, this looks like it's 50 pages long. That must be good. It doesn't have any of the things that I want. Then let's cut and paste it in. Mm -hmm. Now, no, I've never had more than 10% of what's on a job description, and I've gotten hired on every interview except one I've ever been in. And one day I'll tell you the joke of the story where they like me so much, but I ran three miles and 
in less than 18 minutes in a suit. And it was a real disaster and I looked pretty terrible. <laughs> so they called and, and they said, Mike, you're the smartest, best person we've interviewed, but we think you're sloppy, but that'll be something fun for another day to talk about as a joke. But <laughs> our students get hired every day. Now, Manil, I'm gonna tell you this right now. If you've got bad stuff on your resume, like a SysOps or a DevOps or a cloud developer certification, you're gonna be asked all kinds of tech stuff on an interview. Now, if you've got design, present, and sell things, that's what you're gonna be asked. But cloud architects do not code. Um, I usually, I don't have it on this computer. Um, do you, either one of you have the list of things that, that, that the CIOs want in the cloud architect in front of you um, from CIO magazine? Say that again. Do either one of you have the list of what CIOs want in a cloud architect in front of you from CIO magazine? Uh, I can have it pretty quick. Yeah. Because that list is exactly what we do as architects. And I'm going to tell you right now, I get people hired every single day of the week or almost every day of the week as an architect, and none of them know how to code. Yeah, uh, so so here, I'll, I'll let you give the intro to what this is, and then yeah. I'll give the rundown. So what happened was, you know, there were a bunch of ridiculous job descriptions that were out there. And most architects like me, we used it as a comedy routine to get together with our friends three or four eight times a year. We'd open up a Macallan 25 and have a shot and sip it for about an hour, hour and a half expensive drink but so be it and you know it wasn't as expensive years ago but that's neither here nor there but you know we look at these things and laugh and i'd say hey any architect in fact i was just speaking to a senior solution architect uh, saturday afternoon at aws and i said have you ever coded and he's like architects don't code and then we talked to a principal architect recently with uh at microsoft and he says look the only common thing you'll get to with architects is we don't touch the technology ever that's an engineer's job so chris why don't you get to the list Okay, so what Mike was trying to say before he got before he got long winded is that things got so bad and so confusing that CIO Magazine and Gartner uh, went and talked with CIOs to find out what they actually want in a cloud architect. So this is a list from CIO Magazine, um, who is the person that employs cloud architects. The CIO. So, the CIO, the Chief Information Officer, or in some cases, Chief, Techno Chief Technology Officer. But uh, so these are from CIOs that the cloud architect is someone that leads the cultural change for cloud adoption, develops and coordinates cloud architectures, develops a cloud strategy and coordinates the adapt adoption process. They find talent with necessary skills. They assess application software and hardware create the cloud broker team, establish best practices for cloud act, cloud across the company. They select cloud providers and vet third-party services, oversee governance and mitigate risk, work closely with IT security to monitor privacy and development incident response procedures, managing budgets and estimating cost, operating X scale. Now, what, what, what Mike usually does at this point is he does his one, 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 you know, does, which side's tech, which side's business. I'm just going to be a lot harsher than Mike is normally. None of that is tech. All of that is business. Yeah. Um, and and you you can justify some of that as tech stuff, but in 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 a business person's mind, which I'm a, I'm I'm the business mind, <laughs> that is all business stuff, and that is from the tech side of my business. That those all the responsibilities of that position are business focused flavored with a little bit of tech mm. so not coding not how to do linux i don't even know how to talk no. about linux <laughs> no, no, no but, containerization no linux right. no bootstrapping uh no hello world no pinging none of that <laughs> yeah how do we make our customers business more efficient with technology yep. you know i wish you would have joined us about a year ago the average cloud architect earns 800 dollars a day um, just think, you know, that about a year ago, we had our first conversation. I love your questions and always do. You could be earning $200,000 a year by now. Yeah. So please focus on the right things. All right. So Kumar Kumar says they are currently <laughs> an engineer full-time software engineer, non-cloud, and looking to transition fully into cloud architect career. Current full-time role keeps me very busy. I can imagine that role keeps yep. you very busy. On call all the time. <laughs> yeah. and, it, 
Uh, uh, Is it still possible to transition into this career path working busy full time? Would it make sense to resign current full time role to fully engage in training and to get the best benefit? No, I'm going to address this. No. Kumar, don't quit your day job. I have students getting hired every single day of the week that work full time, as well as people who have never worked in tech that are getting their first solution architect job. And I like to use the example of Daniel Boso. And the reason I love to use the example of Daniel Boso is he did not graduate high school. His last job was selling shoes at Nordstrom. And still, J.P. Morgan Chase hired him as a cloud architect in about eight months in our training. And the point is, if he can do it, all of you can. Now, here's the thing. The fact that you're employed in tech is a fantastic thing. Now, granted, software engineering has literally speaking nothing to do with cloud architecture. But here's the good news. There's still lessons that you learned along the way. And here's the thing. When you have and come from a tech background, you get bigger offers. So last year, the majority of our offers between $120,000 and $287,000 per year. We had a few people that that were application developers, that were database architects in their past life, database developers, administrators and things that had lots of years experience. And guess what? They were getting jobs over $250,000 straight out of our program, and you can too. So the key is, at least the way we do our training, is we give people a year in our program. And the point is, if somebody can dedicate, say, 20 hours a week, six, and they've got a tech background, in about six months, nine months, they've got a new career. And you're always more employable when you're always more employed because you look like you have something to offer. And life is a lot more comfortable when you're not struggling financially. So the key is, you know, I worked at Cisco as a lead enterprise architect, and I did an MBA full time at the same time, and you can do it. And believe me, the MBA that I did was a lot more miserable than our wonderful program. We got awards for this program because we get people hired every day. But the plan is, yes, you can still do it, but please don't get give up on your day job until you're hired. It's just not worth it. Now, if you've got a spouse, that's earning really well and you don't need to work, that's another story. But financial security is a good thing. And sometimes people panic when they don't work and they end up taking the first job. And you know, if you do your thing properly, Kumar, you may get an offer for 120, an offer for 180, and an offer to 260. And you don't have to jump on the first one when you're already employed and making money. So I'd recommend you continue to work, do the program on your own time, Take a little longer to do it because you're still earning. Alonzo, I will let you take the next question. Sure, Chris. Carlo Pacini, I believe the life of an architect has a lot of problem solving. What is the best way to solve problems? Well, you know what? (laughs) (laughs) That's a timely question. (laughs) Exactly. It, it, It was just custom suited, you know. Carlo, um, I think you're definitely right. Um, There's a lot of problem solving on a lot of different levels from ascertaining the best solution for the client, understanding what the problems are in the first place, what the problems to the problems are. I mean, we can go on and on about that. However, there is, you, you talk about where is the best way to solve problems. We can break that down in a lot of different ways, Carlo. Uh, we talk about problem solving with what the solution is. Why isn't it working now? When can it work later? What is going to be the time frame of three months, two years, six years? How long is this architecture going to work? Um, We mentioned um, about problem solving over this last uh, soft skills class that we had. We wish you were there. We had tons to talk about. And we, uh, you know, if you were a student, you were definitely would have benefited tremendously from that. But what it comes to, Carlo, is that we talk about qualitative, quantitative. We talk about tech problems. We talk about how to deal with personality conflicts. There are so many levels and there's no one way to solve a problem because we don't know what the issue is. We always refer back to Pareto's law, 20 percent versus the 80 percent of how it affects everything. So you have to understand what the initial issue is so that you can formulate how to create a problem for that specific issue. So it's all about understanding what the problem is. Uh, Mike, over to you. Yeah, sounds great. So, you know, I want to tell you how you do this as an architect. 
We do it a couple ways. And I'll, and we had a great class on this last Friday with our architect team. Yeah. But you have to remember, in most cases, if you're a good architect, you're going to get architectures that are going to be so big, every time you look at it, you're going to go, uh-oh, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> so the thing yeah. to do is the following. The reason, the reason people don't want a 10X AWS certified architect is they want someone that's an architect, not a techie. You can't know enough to solve all these things, even if you were an immortal and lived thousands of years. It would take too long. So the first thing you need to do is really look at the problem and break it down into mini problems. Because yeah. with every system, you got the whole global thing, but what business thing needs to be done? What security things are they looking for? What's the networking thing? What's the compute thing? What are the application things? Break it down. Now, the next thing, Carlo, is to build your team. Remember, every time you hear me talk about an architect and when the CIO magazine talked about leading the cultural change for cloud adoption and building teams and hiring people, there's a reason for it. You take the problem, you break it down into manageable problems, and then your job is to go sell people to come work for you to help you solve those problems. So you build the biggest team, and that's how you solve it. And, you know, I'm going to tell you how I built my career. I've always kept a secret, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. So the, there was an architecture that built my career. I had to create a global voice network for one of the world's largest banks. And guess what, Carlo? I knew nothing about voice. And my manager says, guess what, Mike? You are the lead on the most critical voice project in all of Cisco. And oh, by the way, John Chambers is going to be coming down and looking at this periodically. Mm. And the chief technology officer would fly in once a month. And I'm on a project that I knew nothing of. This built my career, by the way, Carlos. So the first thing I did was said to my manager, you know, I don't know voice. Who can I call and what kind of team can I build? And my manager, Don, says to me, anyone you need, anyone you want. And I went, okay. He said, but you're going to have to get their manager's approval. So I started at the senior vice president level because I figured I was going to need a lot of really smart people. And I asked them each, can I borrow this number of people for this month? Yes. Can we get some of them to live in New Jersey for the next six months? It's this place that I found for them. Sure, Mike, if it's this big, of course we can. And then I brought them in a room day in and day out for about eight weeks and we designed something. Then there was a proof of concept. I brought the team. I bought lunches, dinners, drinks. I was a, and you know I spent that year $200,000, I'm not joking, of company money on the corporate credit card on buying dinners and drinks and entertaining people. Then our RFP came out, request for proposal. We created a proposal. We met, negotiated a deal. And next thing you realize, the customer used it. And the key is, Carlo, how did I do something with technology I didn't? I took the problem. I broke it down into little mini problems. And I brought in the right experts to do this. Yeah. And that's why they don't want 10x AWS certified people. They want leaders for these roles. All right. I missed a question from earlier. Well, let's answer it. All right. I'll let you read it off, Alonzo. All right, Mr. Dominic, one, two, three. Hi, all. Honestly, I feel a bit dumb and overwhelmed when looking at the content I need to learn. I am motivated, but I'm not sure where to start learning as there are so many new things. Any tips? Mr. Dominic, did you read all the content and the original information of the of the course? It would It should give you all the information you need on where to start, when to start, and all these things. So it's very, very important that everyone, once you initially take part in the course, that you read everything. But if that's all under the assumption, if you are a student, but if not, we definitely recommend that you become our student. But if so, uh, if you have other alternatives, then it's all about you taking the time to review all the content that you need, understand where you are and what you want to be, and you have to amass those type of resources so that you can get an, a full understanding if you want to be a cloud architect. But from a, a structured perspective on what we offer for all our students, I believe that we can definitely help you. I'm what about add, you guys? I'm going to add a little of that. You know, honestly, Mr. Dominic, there's a Navy SEAL that 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 really taught some mental toughness training, and I really like him. His name is Mark Devine, and his expression is, "If you have to eat the elephant, do it one bite at a time." Yes. Now, here's the thing. There's a lot of things to learn, but you can do it. It's in you. So whether you train with us, and it'll be a lot easier, or if you're owner, it'll be a lot harder, but you can still do it. Build yourself a list of the things we told you. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a course like ours, do lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. Now, if you're in a course like ours and there's a word you don't understand, guess what? Go to a dictionary, go to the internet and learn it until yeah. you truly know. And that's how good students get through. 
that's how I did it in my career, but a big college, master's degrees, both master's degrees, that's what you do. But the point is, you can't do anything without the network at all. You must understand it. So break it down into small pieces. If you're with us, and it's a logically organized flow, step one, step two, step three, all the way to step a thousand, and do it exactly that way and come to class and participate. If you're on your own, break it down into individual elements and learn element one, element two, element three, element four, all the way to element 99. Guess what? You're going to be fine. But the thing is, you got to believe in yourself and you have to start at the foundation. Now, in our course, we actually put it down into a logical flow that works every single day. But, you know, the, the team that put it together has over a million dollars of education and between 250 and 300 years of professional experience. But that's our world. We've gotten professional educators. We've had people consult that were literally the chief people officer, which means the person that runs HR for organizations. We have HR people, marketing people, sales people, architects to train our people. But if you're on your own, guess what? Take the things that are in that how to get your first cloud job webinar, write them all down and learn step one, step two, step three. But whenever you got a big task, you got to break it down into small plan things. And then you've got to create a plan. And for each step that you need to learn, create a specific, measurable, achievable results or an end time based goal. I will learn IP addressing, subnetting, and supernetting by March 26, 2023. And do that. And when you get that, go out that night, celebrate, and the next day, start the next thing. I will learn this by the XYZ time. You'll get there. You're going to do great. All right. So let's see. Our next question is. From Get Inspired, I have an AWS Solution Architect Associate cer mm. certification, but now how do I get a job? That's the question of the day. <laughs> it is. Okay. Get in go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Alonzo. I didn't see you. Okay, well, Get Inspired, let's, let's be honest. Um, we want you to understand that a certification does not encompass all of the skills required to become a cloud architect. We just want to be honest with you. Um, it gives you a AWS perspective of cloud solutions that they can offer to a client, but not the overall cloud solutions all companies need access to, to make intelligent, objective, and financially sound decisions. So how do you get a job? What you do is that you need to understand that you have to get all cloud knowledge that you have. We definitely showcase in CIO what all cloud architects need, not any AWS cloud solution service providers perspective on that. You need to understand about networking overall, the agnostic version of what uh, networking encompasses for everything you need. Uh, you need to understand next generation firewalls. You need to understand how networking works, like concepts like BGP, SASE, and so forth. We need to know, uh, and, and but overall, even though, and this is with the assumption of, of you wanting to be a cloud, uh, a solution architect. So um, we need to know specifically what you want to do with your job, what you want to do as a career, and what that career path entails. So laying that all out would help us get a very good understanding of how you want to go about being educated and having the overall cloud knowledge that you need to be successful. What about you, gentlemen? Well, I'm going to say this, get inspired. First, we need to know the job you want, which Alondo was alluding to. And here's the reason why. A cloud architect designs, presents, and sells. A cloud engineer builds and configures. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional, not the associate, is about 5% of what an architect needs and about 10% of what an engineer needs. So we need to know what that is. Now, once we know what kind of job you want, we can easily guide you, but an architect skills are over here and an engineer skills are over here. And they're about as different as a doctor and nurse. They both do completely different jobs. The doctor diagnoses and sells and builds the plan and the nurse carries out the plan. Two critically equal people involved in the patient care system. A pilot and a flight attendant have a different job too. One flies the plane, one keeps the patients and the passengers safe. So if you tell us your job, we can help you. But if it's a cloud architect, we can give you more information. And you can attend our completely free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar on uh, Thursday. And we'll spend hours answering that exact question. All right, so back to a question from Carlo. 
Is it realistic to aim at the enterprise architect as my first tech job? What is the best way to prepare for and get an enterprise architect career? Well, Carlo, I've been an enterprise architect a long time, and it's not a realistic first job. A cloud architect or solution architect, sure, I get people to do this every day. Enterprise architect, no way. So if you want to get an enterprise architect job, you're going to need the following. Architecture knowledge and a lot, a lot more business acumen. Because you got to remember, the enterprise architect job is a business job, not a tech job, a business job. So we need to be very careful of that. Now, we've created an elite cloud architect program which teaches those exact enterprise architect skills and cloud architect skills. But the reality is, even if through that program, you're going to need to be like a cloud architect for about a year or two before you could move into an enterprise role. Or if you're already an architect, you could do one of the following. We have a how to make more money in tech program, which really teaches you those elite enterprise architect skills, which could easily help you. Or you can get an MBA. But you got to remember, these are business skills. Now, I created that how to make more money in tech program along with my team and along with executives, executive coaches, and anybody you can possibly be imagine that's held three to $700,000 a year jobs because they know how to get there because they've already been doing it. But the key that you need to understand is you need the foundational architect skills first to then be able to get these jobs. Now, if you want to take our elite architect program, we could make it pretty easy for you. You'd have all the skills to basically work as a cloud architect, but do it the enterprise architect way. And then after a year or two, maybe three, switch into the enterprise architect world. That's what I did. And I mean, I was a principal architect within two years at that time I decided to look at technology. And let me tell you, Carla, what, the right pro what that actually equates to in today's world. We've got Google paying over $500,000 a year for the average principal architect. We've got AWS paying $378,000 a year for the average principal architect. We've got Oracle paying about $300,000 a year for the average cloud architect and principal cloud architect and Microsoft paying for a principal solution architect 379. So there's that. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind that yes, that's how you get there. It's the architect side, but it's the business acumen, soft skills, executive presence, communication, leadership. And that's why we created the elite architect program as well as the how to make more money in tech program because they're both going to get you there. Get inspired. You when you want to be a cloud engineer, we can help you now. So remember, what's in the AWS Solutions Architect Professional is about 5% of what you need. So what is that other 95%? Well, you have to understand those networking and data center components because you're going to be moving things to the cloud. After that, you need to know Linux or a cloud engineer in depth to the level of a Linux engineer. You're going to need to know Python for a cloud engineer because they actually code, and you're going to need to know it well. You're going to need to know Bash scripting and Windows PowerShell scripting, and that's going to help you. Then you're going to need to know Terraform infrastructure as code. And then you're going to need, need deep knowledge in networking and data center technologies. And you can do that, and you can get hired. But now the certified solution architect professional by itself is not enough to get anywhere there. You need to do these things. And you need to, as a cloud engineer, be a master at the CLI, too. Because while the architects don't touch the tech, those cut engineers are hands on people. Hands on, definitely. But I'm going to tell you this you want to be a cut engineer, I'm going to make this recommendation for you. If you live in the US or the UK or Canada or Australia, I would be very cautious on desiring to be a cloud engineer for the following reasons. Right now, after COVID, the world made it that it doesn't matter where your people are, it doesn't matter if my engineer is in Cameroon, uh, California. Chicago, Cayman Islands, or Cambodia, but here's what matters. You need to earn $416,000 a year to buy a basic home in San Francisco. Here's what else matters. Functionally speaking, $100,000 US dollars is the equivalent of $28,000 in India. So where would a business hire its people in a world after, after the pandemic where it doesn't matter where you're at? They can pay $56,000 to somebody in India to get a great cloud engineer or they can pay $200,000 to get the same equivalent of engineer in America. Now, I want you to also think of something else, get inspired. Chat GPT can code. Mm -hmm. Chat GPT can configure the cloud. So realize if you become a cloud engineer, not an architect, these skills can't be changed. You probably have three to 10 years left of your career. Now, Chat GPT is just the basics. GPU performance is doubling every 18 months. 
FPGAs and ASICs are starting to be able to do machine learning and expect, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence in about five to 10 years to be able to take away everybody's cloud engineer job. So if you want to be a cloud engineer, that's okay. Make sure you develop your business acumen, your soft skills, your executive presence, your communication skills, your leadership skills. And that way, when engineering dies, you can move into an architecture role or just become an architect in the first place. But that's how you become an engineer. But please keep that in the back of your mind. Engineering careers are going to be dying if you're in the US, the UK, Canada, and things like that. But there'll be a boom for places like Africa, India, Pakistan, where you can get a highly educated population where you can easily outsource them. Since we're already kind of talking on that topic, there's this mm -hmm. question, yeah. and then there. So this one is in this time of recession, which cloud jobs are under major risk, and what's your safer positions? And then there's this question: How long until AI replaces cloud architects? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I'll answer the first right. one, and then and we'll talk about why AI can never replace the cloud architect. Unless yeah. we start with this: AI can never replace the cloud architect because of what cloud architects do. A cloud architect interviews a CEO. And they ask, what business goals, business pain points do you have? The cloud architect then interviews the department heads, the frontline workers, and finds out what they want. Now, the cloud architect also examines the business processes that these organizations use. Now, the cloud architect has to build a team of 40 to 50 people and lead that team to, to the whatever the best solution actually architecture is. And a solution architecture is not about tech. AI can do tech. Solution architecture is about business, building the business's performance, whether it's increasing revenue, improving employee productivity, removing costs, uh, or, or, or optimizing collaborations, optimizing the supply chain, reducing error defects. And you, AI can't do that. So for the architect that's going to go to the customer and meet these things, it can't be replaced. It's the human side that separates architects and engineers. It's the finesse job. It's the sales. It's the negotiation of the deals. It's the person presenting at the conferences and getting people excited about what the tech can do for their business. AI can't replace architects, but AI can and will replace engineers. So for my engineers, my recommendation is get out of engineering and move into architecture. Your career is going to be dead soon. For my architects, keep focusing on your architects. But don't, 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 don't focus on destroying your career by getting 10x AWS certified. Focus on the high value target things like business acumen. So Carlos, why am I so obsessed with business acumen? Well, if you go to salary.com, you'll see that the average job with business acumen required earn $549,000 a year. And here's some other jobs with business acumen. Principal architect at Microsoft is an architect with business acumen. We're dealing with, uh, and this is from Glassdoor 379. Principal solutions architect with Amazon, guess what? We're also dealing with 372. Now, Oracle pays the least, so their average pay is just under $300,000 for an architect with business acumen. Now, what about Google? Google pays its average solution architect, a principal architect with business acumen, $508,000. Now, let's look at other jobs which architects move into all the time, like directors and senior directors. Here we go. Senior director at Cisco, $527,000 a year. Senior Director at Palo Alto Networks, $540,000 a year. So this is why when people say, Mike, which one of these search should I get? I say, don't waste your time with this nonsense. Mm -hmm. Develop your sales skills, your executive presence, your business acumen. And then you're the kind of architect that I was. Someone that's con considered a thought leader can shape an injury. And I could get a job, literally speaking, three by the end of the day with any main club of our went. And because of that, that's what they're looking for. So Carlos. Don't let yourself be outmoded by technology. Focus on the things that require the most humanity. And you'll earn the most and never have to worry about being replaced. Yeah. And so back to the one before that. In this time of recession, which cloud jobs are under major risk and which are safer mm. positions? Safer positions are these. And then Chris can add to some experience from his HR background. Account managers or sales reps or cloud architects are the safest positions. And here's the reason why. In a recession, organizations still need to make money. So who sells this stuff? It's the account executive. It's the solution architect. 
they design, present, and sell the solution. So Carlo, in a recession, a guy like me can close two, three hundred million dollars a year in solution architectures, which is going to bring in money to the business. They can't afford to lose that. Now, Carlo, I want you to think about this. Does it matter where my engineer is? No. So you, the two hundred thousand dollar engineers that exist in the U.S. they're fired. And they're going to be outsourced to somebody in India or Africa that can do the job equally well because it doesn't matter where you do your coding from. Operations positions, as a rule, marketing, not sales positions, marketing positions get cut. So anything that companies see as a cost get laid off in a recession. And any of the people, for example, that are an asset are considered a recession. Now, recently, one of my cloud engineers got hired viewed about a month ago from a big cloud provider, but my architects are still getting hired. Even during bad times, and even by the people that are hiring freezes. Why? They're quietly hiring. They're hiring people for specific jobs. So when the internet boom crashed, Carlo, back in 2000, and Cisco did like a 25% layoff and everybody got laid off, I kept getting hired. Why? Because I was helping organizations sell their technology and make money. So in bad economic times, and I've been through a few recessions, be on the sales side, hence the architecture jobs, or be an account executive. Good there, but don't be on the post sales engineering side. They're the jobs that get crushed. Because what would you do if you're an executive? You ha you ha have no money. Hire somebody for twenty eight thousand dollars in India or a hundred thousand in the U.S. It's the same money. It's worth the same amount of money when you adjust for the cost of living. So where are you going to hire your people? You're not going to hire anybody in California. They'll lay all those people off. May hire some people and fire in Texas where you can pay them thirty percent less and they have the same amount of money. Or you can hire somebody for 25% of what you're paying who's motivated, desires to do the job. So don't be in a, a place. Now, Chris, you've had to lay people off, unfortunately, and you've been on the HR side. Who gets laid off in a recession from your perspective? Yes, yeah, that's, that's pretty pretty much spot on. Um, the people that can bring in revenue are constrained cost will be the ones that stay. Yeah. Uh, so, because constraining cost is just as important as uh, bringing in revenue. So those those roles are the ones that are that are safe. Uh, anything that can be automated is not the right word, but anything that can be increased efficiency. Yes, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I was trying to think of <laughs> anything that anything where there's with anything with less human interaction is going to be affected. Yeah. Uh, because the more human interaction you have with people that will be spending money, the more valuable you are to the organization. Um, now, also, uh, you all you will actually see salespeople losing jobs um, and you will see account people losing jobs. And these people are in divisions, are on products, are on projects that were already revenue losers, losers, mm -hmm. and they were just being kept on the books to to end of life of the to, to basically, basically just kind of keep things balanced out. But uh, now that there's a reason or need to cut, uh, trim the fat, uh, those positions are being eliminated, even though they are sales positions. They're sales positions for products that the company was no longer wanting to support. So those positions are being eliminated. So I did want to bring that one up that you Good will point. see you will see some sales. It, it kind of falls in line with our, our our the the concept of keeping your keeping your worst ten percent so that you can eliminate them when the layoffs come. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that's a practice that that major companies and employers do. Uh, so that not just on an employee level, but a, an entire department level. Um, or an entire project level or program level, uh, they'll keep those uh, poor performing divisions uh, and projects and use them at a moment's notice when they need to cut cut expenses. Um, so that's that's my two cents there. Great point. Um, sorry, my nose is really itchy today. I don't know <laughs> if I got allergic to my cat all of a sudden, but yeah. All right. Um, there was a qu question in here that was really concerning that we need to address. There was a couple of comments before, but none of them made any sense. But this one, 
actually made a little it, it, the, the the verbiage made sense not the topic okay. eventually you need an architecture in production and no. you must support it therefore 99 okay. of architects need to be dual headed as devops engineers scott New there's no truth to this whatsoever none in fact, none none here's the here's, nope the second you sell the architecture it gets hands on this to a different team and they do they build it so the process is this the account team sells it account manager uh, uh, architect next customer says yes after the negotiation process if it's a big customer a service delivery executive comes in which is a director level person and they bring in a team of post sales implementation people if you work for an aws azure cisco google as an architect you will not be allowed to touch your customer systems ever you're not allowed to and if you do you're going to be fired on the spot because you're not allowed you're not considered one of the official smart people that's allowed to touch things you never ever ever touch the customer's technology as no. Mm-hmm. And if there's a proof of concept, you bring engineers. So architects never do DevOps. Not one, not today, not ever. Now, there are DevOps engineers that like to call themselves architects. But here's the thing. They're not meeting with the CEO. They're not mm-hmm. examining the business You're problem. Nope. And they're doing what they call a technical design, which is not architecture. And architecture is a business thing. You will never, in a normal architect job, support anything. You build, You design it. Somebody else builds it. And guess what? The way it normally works is, hmm. You design it, then it gets handed to a team of cloud engineers and a few DevOps engineers to build it, and that gets handed off to the operations people, which are called sysops or maintenance people. Even the DevOps engineers don't support it at that point. These things are three-tiered. Operations, maintenance, building, and designing. They're not even related to each other. All different jobs. Kind of like you may take your car to the airport, but then you may fly in an airplane and then you may take a boat to ex- or a ferry to get to your ultimate destination. You can't fly the plane, drive the car, and be in the ferry at the same time. You need an airplane pilot. You need a ferry boat driver and a car driver. Three separate jobs, three separate things. This is never the case, Scott. And when it is, it's an engineer position where somebody likes to call themselves an architect. Well, when it is, it's a company you want to run away from. No, because oh, yeah. it's an engineer position. <laughs> They want you to do everything, and then the probably compensation is not even there to build because it's an engineer position, not an architect position. Right. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'd say of the last 150 or so architects we got hired, not a single one of them knows anything about DevOps. And they were hired by AWS, Azure, Google, Cisco, Oracle, Apple, Capgemini, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Accenture. Um, Anyway, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, and I could go on and go on forever. All right. So Varun says it's easier for a technocrat to do tech talking rather than business talking. Yeah, like marketing executives. Yep. Does your does your program help your? Do you help your students get over that bridge? That is of we do. fifty percent of what we do. <laughs> that's fifty percent of our training. Yeah. And that's why engineers that want to be architects need just as much training as a doctor that's never seen the tech before, because the doctor knows how to do the talking, but the techie usually doesn't. So that's the thing, we provide it. That's why our training is 500 hours, and that's why people come to us. And that's why you can't be, get an architect job by just studying the tech. You have to be taught that. Now I'm gonna tell you how I learned it, and which is why I created this program. Well, first, I took seven years in school to learn medicine, and that's where I really learned some of these skills. Then I did an MBA. And then I took about an additional $100,000 of training in presentation skills, sales skills, executive presence, communication skills, CXO relevancy, emotional intelligence. And I know most people cannot afford the $325,000 education I have or the $150,000 education that Alonzo has. And Chris has got about the same thing. And that's why we teach these skills. And that's why it's not just me. We've got executives. We've got sales executives. We have PhD business school professors. We have chief people officers that help advise and interview our people. That's exactly what we do, Brun. And that's why our people get these elite jobs. You said it so well. All right. So let's see. Uh, so I invited the next person to the webinar. Uh, we got a couple of things we're going to put back to back. Currently working as a mobile developer in a large bank, 
The bank encourages intermobility to transition other mm -hmm. careers. Good. That's great. Good. Uh, mm -hmm. I like companies that do that. Um, some companies don't do that, and it's very no, unfortunate. They don't. Can I leverage on the training for a cloud architect career with the same employer? Most Depends likely. on the employer. The employer. How can I make a strong case for a cloud architect role without having background to transition to this career with my current employer? For training. Training. So, yeah. you know, Peter. So the, the, the unfortunate thing, I, I'm going to preface this by saying one small problem with trying to change your perception at your current employer is that the perception is already established. Not saying it can't be done, but it's an obstacle that you you wouldn't have if you were if you were trying to change positions with taking an out a role with another organization. That so it's just an it's a it's a perception thing that I know mm -hmm. Mike is going to address. But I just wanted to bring up that trying to stay within your same organization and change the perception is just an mm -hmm. added it's, it's an added obstacle that you yeah. need to need to take into consideration because within your organization there's already the perception of what your what your role and capabilities are so and he would yeah. probably have to get exterior knowledge if you want to be a boomerang which is someone who would leave a company and come back you would have to um leverage outside training from another company so that you can um basically rebrand yourself uh from a professional and uh perspective as well as your competency so that you can engage in that increased salary and and so forth what about you mike well first peter now you know why we've got a marketing executive with 30 years experience that helps our students with branding i'll tell you what i did peter and first i want to make it clear that it's not your background daniel bose who didn't graduate high school hired by jp morgan chase as a solution architect jennifer mental health tech hired by jp morgan chase as a solution architect vladimir college student hired as a solution architect um, well, I think it was Microsoft. Um, uh, what do you call it? Coyote, hired by AWS, college student. Yvonne Tambo, college student, hired by AWS. I could give you example after example after example. Delroy Bat, EMT firefighter, hired by CDW as a security, uh, cloud security architect. So it's your perception. Now, Peter, I worked at one of the best tech companies in the world. I was at Cisco, and I loved Cisco. And I had my first job as a network architect. My second job was a network architect. My third job was a network architect. And somehow Cisco called me for a job. I hadn't been the US, back in the US for, I think it was six months straight. I'd been going from country to country to country, didn't see my wife. And I was in Reading, UK, and I got a call from Cisco and says, could you come in? And I took a sales engineer position with Cisco. It was beneath any job I ever had. And quickly I was there for about three months and I said, I wanna be on the business side like an architect, and they said, you can't. So Peter, here's what I did. Very quickly, I started watching what the elite executives did, got an MBA, started taking leadership training, and bought about $20,000 of new suits. The next thing is every time my manager asked me about a tech thing, I say, you know, I don't know how that works, but you know what, I know this really great person, let me bring him into the conversation. Now, I did this for about three or four months, and at some point, after about three months of walking like, like an architect, speaking like a business executive and wearing good suits and saying, I don't know how that works, but I know how to solve this business problem. So let me focus on the business problem and poof, I'll bring in the engineers. All of a sudden, people were treating me like an architect. So what did I do? I saw the director level architect position that was open and I applied for it. And I had 16 interviews to get it because I was in the company and it was such a hard interview to job to get and I got hired on it. And that was my history going from architect to elite enterprise architect. And I was the lead architect for basically the entire healthcare division at Cisco. But yeah, I had to rebrand myself. Now, Peter Morgan, that can be a little scary way to rebrand yourself. And the other times, you know, a lot of my people, basically I put them through the training and put them through the rebranding. A lot of them always a major impact on some of the branding and marketing training. We have ways that we teach people how to reposition their current experience. And they usually go to another bank or another provider to get that. But you can do it in your own company too. I've had students that have done it recently this year. I had somebody in customer service that got moved into a strategy position by doing just this at one of your biggest tech companies very recently. So that's what you gotta do. You gotta basically convince people you're somebody new. And uh, 
You got to change it. So, Peter, you know when we talk, 55% is what you look like when you say something, 38% is what you sound like when you say something, and 7% is your actual content. So it's a matter of learning everything. An engineer, here's how they present. Problem, 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 solution. An architect, here's how they print. Here's the solution to solve your problems, and here's the substantiating evidence. So you literally have to flip the script on them and show that you're exactly what you are. Mm -hmm. And they'll take notice. All right. So next question is how to become a business architect. What's the accurate route? Well, if I use a business architect is different than a cloud architect. 99% of business architects have MBAs and it's nearly impossible to get a business architect job without an MBA. So to get one of these jobs, I suggest you apply to a top 10 MBA program if you want to be a business architect. Because a business architect is also called a management consultant. And for a management consulting role, it's all about MBAs. And typically speaking, what they if you're new, what they can do is you can get an MBA. And if you're young, they'll put you in like McKinsey would do it, Accenture does it. They have like their little training program. Yeah. They bring you in as an associate or a manager, basic early role. And then they teach you what shoes to wear, how to make sure your shoes are polished, to make sure your shirts uh, match with your pants, what colors can coordinate with what, what you need to look like. Alonzo shaking his head, his wife is a business architect. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it, it's kind of the same way this works. And I was a business architect and I loved it. All right, so let's see. Next question. What books can you recommend for business acumen and executive presence? Hmm. Well. Caveat. You're not going to learn it all from a book. No. no. There, are, <laughs> there are some good books out there, but it's not going to be enough. No, not even close. So my recommendation would be is you got two choices. You can either take a course like our How to Get More Money in Tech program or get an MBA for your business acumen. And for executive presence, you're going to need it in the following ways. Speak easy. It's about three to $4,000 for the week. Has a really good uh, how to talk so people listen. That's the beginning of your executive presence. I've actually had a coach for executive presence now for over 20 years. And she's helped me hire an executive coach to work on your executive presence. And then take some executive presence training. I'm going to tell you right now, that training itself is going to cost you ten to $20,000. And that's why I created the how to get make more money in tech program where we teach all these things. But... For business acumen, it's not coming from books because you're going to need to read books on finance. You're going to need books on accounting. You're going to need to read books on marketing. You're going to need to understand the difference between financial accounting and managerial accounting. You're going to have to understand macroeconomics and microeconomics. You're going to need to understand management and project management. And then you're going to need to learn about that vertical industries like the way healthcare operates and things versus the bank operates. So, I mean, it's not like I can give you a list of 10 books and it's going to give you an answer. No. I can tell you that I have personally read on the leadership, sales, and communication side well over 3,000 books. And I actually went to two MBA programs. I know that sounds crazy. I went to Drexel University early in my career in Philadelphia, and I got three quarters of the way through the program. And then I got a job that was an offer I couldn't refuse. So I went to take the job and didn't finish it. And then 10 years later, I went to Widener University and did a full master's degree there from the scratch. And I really enjoyed it. So that's the way you get business acumen and executive presence. Alonzo, you went and got an MBA for your business acumen, right? Yes, I did. Chris, you have an MBA? Yes, I do. I didn't, learn any, I didn't learn any executive presence in my no, MBA. You won't learn executive <laughs> presence in an MBA program, but you no. will get your business acumen there. Yes, you will. Indeed. And that's why I do both. And that's why I created the How to Make More Money in Tech program, because that's the secret to really earning more. But in a bit, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an MBA, they're like, here, write this 40-page document with American psychiatric citations. And what they needed to tell you was, here, write this two-page document and make it really easy to understand. Because the people that actually buy are the executives that make the decisions. They don't care about the tech, and they don't have time to read a 40-page paper. No. You put it in front of them, and it gets thrown in the trash. Yeah, and while we're on the topic of MBAs, um, somebody asked the question earlier about MBAs. 
uh, like what's what specialty or area? I can't find the question right now. Um, if you if if you if you if you have to put down a specialty or an area for your MBA, then do uh, then you want to do management. Yes. Um, so also something else about MBAs. Um, and this is my personal perspective. MBAs are a dime a dozen. Yep. Except for a handful of universities. So if you have the ability to get an MBA from a, uh, you know, Northwestern or Penn or Harvard or Duke or something like that, yes, get it. Um, if not, get it at any old local college. Yeah. Uh, and I say this because I did the same thing. I got it at a small school in Mississippi where the CEO of UPS also got his degree. Nobody knows the name of the school. It doesn't matter. Nope. It doesn't matter. We got the MBA. We got the business acumen. Um, I'm, I'm here and he's over at UPS, <laughs> but you know, not, we weren't at school at the same time, but you know, it doesn't, it, it, it the, the MBA is a dime a dozen. You can yeah. get it at, uh, I got mine at a school called Delta State University. Uh, I know people in our program that are getting theirs at a school called Murray State in Kentucky and, you know, Eastern New Mexico or Florida South, South University of South Florida or Florida Atlantic or, you know, University of Tennessee Martin or, you know, any, an MBA yeah. at the end of the day mm -hmm. is just a, it, it, it gets you the business acumen. You're not going to get the executive presence. No, and any of them. Any of them. Even the even the Harvards and the Dukes and the any, you might get it from the um, supplemental things that you have access to in those types of programs. The the things that are outside the classroom that you right. have access to in, in programs at, at schools like a Duke or a Northwestern or a Harvard. You know the 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 roundtables that they have the the events that they have, the networking they have, the the workshops that they have that are outside the actual curriculum at those programs. You might, you, you'll probably get some exposure to executive presence, but, but in 99% of your MBAs, it's, it's business acumen and it's going to be the same business acumen from no, every MBA go. program. Right. So. In, in fact, I presented at a lot of these universities, the elite universities that Chris is talking about. And here's the thing. There are, there's a lot of people there that have money. Otherwise, you wouldn't go. I had the opportunity to go to one of these top 10, but I didn't want to spend that few hundred thousand dollars because it just didn't see, it seemed wasteful to me. So the thing was, is as following. Most people with money have executive presence, no CXO relevancy, and no leadership. So when you're at one of these places and you're at the country club, the golf club, or the yacht club, you have to communicate in a certain way and you develop upon it. That's why I took, we created our environment because I know most people can't afford to go to the yacht club. And you know what? If you look like you belong in the yacht club, guess what? You get a job that pays you like you belong in the yacht club. But if you don't have the language or you don't have the body language or you don't know what to say or have the presence, they see you as an outsider. So it's not what you look like. It's what, whether you feel like you fit, fit in. Every gang has a, its own language. And it doesn't matter if it's the country club gang, a group of Navy SEALs, or a gang in the inner city. Every gang has their language and their uniform. The key for you is to fit into the right gang, whichever gang you choose to be. All right. So uh, Brennan says, what would you recommend for someone like me who has 20 years in IT with the last 10 years of my career as a system administrator mm -hmm. is moving to the cloud? That's a good question. What do you want to do? Yeah. At the end you of the day, you need to know what your desires are. Yep. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Can't we can't we can't uh, give too much of a response without knowing what you'd like to do. Yeah. So if we know what you'd like to do, we can give a response. Because that's the key. At the end of the day, it's what do you want to do? Yeah. yeah. Um, Lady Godiva. Hey, <laughs> uh, Mike. Do you think that there are any additional skills a cloud architect might need in this evolving economy? I know this is something that we talk about considering the, re the recessionary concerns and tightening up of corporations and 
things like that. So that, that's a good question. And it's a great question. And Lady Godiva, as the technology changes, as the technology becomes more simple, it's really about who can build the best teams, who can be the best leader, who can sell the most. And look, sales is everything. I want you to understand how far sales actually goes. We're not talking about like a car salesman that tells you what you want to hear to buy a car. That's not sales. If you're a doctor and you want to convince your patient to take their medicine, you need sales skills. If you're a parent and you don't want your kid to jump off the roof because he thinks it's a good idea, you need sales skills. Otherwise, the time you turn your head, the kid's going to do something stupid and they end up as my patient. So you need sales skills. So sales, Lady Godiva, is there. Now, as the architect's role develop, and remember, I've been in the architect roles from the early days. It's been more business, more business, more business, more business, and more business. So I would focus more on business, 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 more on sales, more on executive writing, more on executive communication, more on executive presence or gravitas. Those are the skills that make you stand out. I mean, they just they just do. And emotional intelligence, whoa. That's the secret weapon. You know, it was in Forbes recently that employers will actually pay more and are more willing to hire people that are less smart, IQ-wise, and have more emotional intelligence. I think it's Talent Smart did the research and they found that people with better emotional intelligence on average jobs, not tech jobs, average jobs, earn $29.6,000 more a year, plus $1,300 per additional point of uh, executive uh, emotional intelligence question. Now, that's an average. Now, a job like tech that pays two to three times the average, you add that emotional intelligence, and it can add two to three times an extra $100,000 a year to your career. So Lady Godiva really focus on these elite business skills. Because in the end of the day, this is where everybody takes their architect career wrong. They think they're going to be a tech master and a tech guru. And here's the thing. Let's say Lady Godiva, you've been an architect for 100 years. And you've had 100 years to learn. And let's say I take Alonzo, who's got one year of architecture experience, and he can build a team of 100 people that each have 15 years experience. Alonzo's team has 1,500-year experience. And if you, with 100 years experience, Lady Godiva, only have 100. So the key is how good of a team you can build how good of a leader you can be. That's the secret to being the world's greatest architects. When you get known for being that leader, the world will literally hunt you down and you won't be able to stop your phone from ringing. You're gonna be like me and need a private phone number that the recruiters don't call 24 hours a day, seven days a week saying, are you tired of being so yo? Do you wanna go back to being an architect? All right, so next question. Can I upskill for business architect position after being a cloud architect? Well, you could, and absolutely, Faish, but, you know, it's different. Mm -hmm. So the easiest thing, if you wanted to be a ar business architect, would be to just get an MBA and start out as a business architect. Now, having said that, if you wanted to work in tech for a little while, like I did, and then become a business architect like I did, you could become then a business architect that specializes in digital transformation and how technology can impact business performance, which is what I did. And then that would also be good. So when I was doing business architecture, like 80% of it was business, but I had this little technology specialist. So Faish, you definitely could, absolutely. But it's not the most efficient path. The most efficient path is to go straight for an MBA and get yourself a job at a big four consulting company and learn business architecture. But if that's not in the cards for you and you're not in a position to dedicate the next two years for a master's degree or you don't even have a degree right now sure we can help you get a good cloud architect position and they can pay for your education and you can earn a lot of money in the short term and have a good life let them pay for your degrees and your mbas as well as your leader upset skills sales skills executive presence skills and then poof you'll be the good to go that way. So you could, but honestly, the most efficient way to get there is to just go straight to an MBA. All right. So we're getting, we're getting close to the end of the question. So if there's anyone that's got any last questions, make sure to get them in here before we wrap up. All right, here we go. 
So just curious, as everyone is talking about it, what are your thoughts on chat GPT? Yeah. <laughs> that's it. It's just the beginning. Yeah. That's why we tell people we strongly advise you to not take on engineering careers right now. Yeah. Because chat GPT already can pass certifications like nothing, which means they're irrelevant because technology can replace it. Chat GPT can code. Chat GPT can configure the command line. Now, Ben, I want you to really understand, this is just the beginning. Now, architects are safe, salespeople are safe, business people are safe, but hands-on techies are not safe. Now, imagine when NVIDIA's newest video card comes out and it's improved GPU performance by 90 plus percent next year. And the next one, the next year is another 90% greater. You, you think about that, we're going to have 10x, 10x GPU performance in about five, six years. That means our chat GPT can be 10 times better in a matter of five or six years. Now, Ben, there's also a migration off of GPUs onto hardware things such as uh, FPGAs and ASICs. And those things can do things thousands of times faster than a GPU. So that's why, Ben, we stopped telling people to do engineering careers. We stopped selling our engineering career too. And lots of people wanted to take it. But we wanted to make sure our engineers had the business skills to get other jobs. And we didn't want to create competition for them. And I don't want to sell a course that I don't feel like there's a good long career. And that's why, you know, there's other people selling engineering careers. I guess that's okay. We chose to stop selling our careers because I don't want to ever, ever, ever sell something that's not going to give people elite opportunities. That's why we're focusing on architects and business executives and interviewing to make sure. And why do we focus on interviewing? Because, you know, in most of these jobs, there's a $100,000 pay range. And if you master the interview, you can come out sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars stronger than someone that doesn't. So that's our world, Ben, helping people build elite careers and earning far more than the competition. All right. So all right. So next question. Just to clarify, your up and coming course will teach the business acumen that would be expected of an MBA graduate. Yes. Mostly. So we will teach the cr most critical MBA thing, business acumen out of an MBA, and in some cases, much more. Now, Gear G, 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 Gear Zenut, we won't be teaching some of the stuff that's taught in MBAs that's not relevant to the business person. So we're going to teach the functional equivalency of the same level of business acumen. And on top of that, we're going to teach the things they don't teach, which is the real leadership, the executive presence, the CXO relevancy, the sales. So what we're trying to do is take 70 or 80% of those critical MBA things and mix it with the additional $100,000 of training I had post MBA to get there. That's what we're teaching. So most of what you need from an MBA, because there's a lot of fluff in an MBA, we're removing all that fluff. And then on top of that, we're adding the really critical stuff that they don't teach in an MBA. So this is really a career optimization program. And that we're talking about our how to make more money in tech program and our elite cloud architect program for those. Those are the two courses we're going to be teaching those skills. All right. So this is our last question so far. Ot says, will the go cloud careers instruction hold the hand of the student who has no cloud architecture knowledge during the program when registered by just learning the cloud rather oh that's a second question okay well it depends which program you registered in you know we're of the belief that you build yourself strong and you get hired look in our elite cloud architect program we have much more customer touch points to make sure it's easier for you. But we're not in the hand-holding mission. I mean, if we needed, we'd have to charge $40,000, $50,000 for a program like that to do this. We are in the position where we take bright people, capable people, and motivated people, and we give them the skills to be great. And that's what we do. Now, in our main classes, we have three live classes per week on a Slack channel. In the elite program, we have the same three classes per week plus a small batch class per week, which is limited to a small number of people in the elite program. And then we have an additional class where people can come and ask their questions each day. And they still have the, the entire 15, uh, two, almost 2,000 person architect community to support them. So yeah, there's a lots of opportunity to do that. But 
we're not in the handholding mission. We're in the I'm in the mission of getting people hired and making them great. That's what we do. And because you know, there's nobody to hold your hand once you get the job. So we train you the way you literally work. Everything we do, every class is exactly what architects do every single time. So that's why we, our success rate is so good because people know and they aggressively recruit our people. I mean, it's every day I've got students saying to me, Mike, what do I do? I just joined your program. I put down Go Cloud Careers on my resume and I've got three interview requests. What do I do? I just, I didn't even, I didn't even read your introduction yet. So it's that, but we provide the finest instruction, but handholding is not on the list of things that we try to do. Yeah, just to just to clarify, you know, it's it's not that there's no support. No, but there's plenty of support. There's support. We're available. We're there to to provide guidance and, and feedback, and show you the way, and give you and give you the resources, and point you to the resources, and 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 host the classes, and 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 all of that good stuff, but. We can't, we can't, we can't call you. We can't, we can't come. Right. As Mike likes to say, we can't knock on your door. We can't call you. We can't send people over to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, that that there's a level of responsibility and uh, and accountability that that is necessary from the individual. Yeah. So so yes, there is support, but uh, there's a level of responsibility and accountability from the individual. Exactly, Chris. I mean, what we teach here is the same thing that you're going to be doing as a cloud architect. No one's going to be holding your hand in the job. So we definitely empower you. And further, there is a uh, global community um, in our Slack uh, app where everyone is focused on the same thing. We encourage everyone to get to know each other, to um, align and study groups if they're in uh, proximity to where you live or if someone that you can really, uh, that has the same goals as being a particular cloud architect, uh, we encourage everyone to do so, so that you can enhance yourself um, without any bespoke uh, training that we don't do. We focus on everyone um, working towards the same goal and taking that initiative to be focused, dedicated, and tenacious in everything that you do. And we emphasize the fact that the training works if you do. Yes. We need you to be focused. We need you to take the initiative um, like everyone else. They uh, alternatively um, sacrifice their social time or anything else so that they can get where they need to be. And we need everyone um, to do their part because we definitely will do our part in providing that training and getting you cloud hired and working towards getting you cloud hired, actually. Yeah, and just to clarify there in the chat box, Lady Godiva is one of our students. We're just we're just not gonna call her by name <laughs> since she uses uh, Lady Godiva as her handle here on YouTube. So the fee the feedback that she's providing is 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 accurate feedback from someone that's within our program. So we we uh, we, we do we do not expect our students to have any knowledge when they come into the program. So we the the environment is such that that we're not expecting you to know anything when you start. So that uh, just to give you a, a, a point of reference from what the what the program is like. Now, follow up question. By just learning the cloud rather than AWS, what certification is issued? A job offer. Yes, that's the certification that's issued. Yes. There's there's many there's many and many 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 examples of people that uh, have gone through our program that have gotten job offers that they don't have certifications or if they've got a certification it's a it's a practitioner certif yeah. certification or or uh, or a no cert as I said no certification at all and and they and they they're getting hired at with six figure salaries as cloud architects and then getting paid to get their certifications. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, but you know, we do provide the training for the AWS certified solution architect professional, as well as the Azure solutions architect expert. And all you have to do is take the exam, but here's the thing. When you know the cloud, it's nothing. How yes. nothing is it? The hardest exam out there is the Google professional cloud architect. I made a bet with the friend. He said, this is a tough exam. You need to study for it for six months. 
And I said to him, I know the cloud. The Google cloud was the only one I never worked on. So I bet you I could pass that exam in two days. And he laughed at me. So I bought a book, the Cybex book, on passing the exam. I read it on Saturday and Sunday, and I'd already scheduled the test for Monday to prove the point. And it was the easiest thing. The machine shut off in 45 minutes because I answered all the questions. If you know the cloud, getting any certification is nothing. I mean, it's silly easy. But if you don't know the cloud, you'll get certified, and you still won't be hireable. So that's why we do what we do. And remember, uh, at the end of the day, the certification is not the finish line. Okay, I think the industry has spent a lot of time focusing on you need to get certified. You need to get certified. Okay, and then what? Are you still are you competent to do the job? Are you able to check those boxes of competency that they need you to do to be successful in the role? So understand that that certification is not the end all to be all. And what we always emphasize is that at the end of the day, if you go to any bank in the world, Swiss Bank, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and you hold your ability to pay off or secure a specific loan and you have a job offer in one hand and the AWS certification in the other hand, odds are they're going to go for that, that, uh, that job offer every time. So remember, it's the competency first, and then you focus on that certification later. Exactly. Yep, legit legitimately, I financed a house with a job offer. So. Yeah. Right. You can't do that with the <laughs> certification. But you know, okay, I want to give you an example that most people can relate to. So I lived in, I grew up in Philadelphia, outside of Greece, well, outside, outside of my family being from Greece, lived in New Jersey. And I decided to move to Florida when I was 30. And I moved to Florida. And I got told I had to go take my driver's exam again. Now, when I was 16 years old and I took my driver's exam, I had to study for that thing. When I was 30 or so, I moved into Florida. I said, just give me the exam. And they're like, do you need the book or anything? I'm like, let's find out. If I fail the exam, I'll get the book. Of course I passed the exam because I knew what a stop sign was and all these other things. So that's the key. When you know the cloud, none of this, all this other stuff is, is just as easy as retaking your driver's test after driving for 20 years. All right. So Duke says, what should a high school student do if they want to get into cloud computing? <laughs> Learn networking. Learn that's it. a good place to start for Learn somebody, somebody young. <laughs> somebody young whereas 10 15 20 years ago everybody was like learn coding don't waste your time with no, that don't don't mm -hmm. i'm just saying like that's the thing that they should do now like they should learn networking if learn they it. have the ability to learn networking they should learn networking like from sis like from cisco material cisco. learn networking not aws not at all um, no. that's a good place to start for somebody that's in high school you know you're 16 15 yeah. 16 17 year old and the reason, and this is just my perspective, I'll let Mike and Alonzo speak to this. And the reason I say that is just because anything other than that would just get in the way of the rest of the things that they should be learning as a high school student. Learn it first. <laughs> you know, you, there's a lot that goes into being uh, into cloud computing. But, you know, I, I, I strongly believe you, you still need to, you, you still need to make sure you learn the things as as a high school student, like mm -hmm. yes. personal economics, uh, yeah. history, you need to learn your history. You need to learn your math. Yeah. <laughs> math yeah. is going to come in handy with the networking. You need to learn your science just so you got a real rounded education. Yeah. Yeah. So I would, I'm just suggesting focus on one thing and that one thing should be networking. Absolutely. Just yeah. Cause you don't want to, I don't, don't want to suggest adding too much into, if you want to add another thing, maybe communication business, like, yeah, very true. communication, executive communication. Uh, but those two would be good for any cloud computing yeah. career. Um, in fact, everything started with networking. The first cloud I worked on was in 1996. It was Frame Relay. Then there was another cloud. So what you find is the network is the foundation to everything. If you don't understand networking, guess what? It doesn't matter how many advanced degrees and certifications you have, you still can't get hired. So learn networking. Yes. And I can yeah. tell you, I'll give you an example. His name is Mitchell Duke. And Mitchell was a kid that was my neighbor in Florida. And he wanted a big tech career. No, Mitchell has a big tech career. A big tech career. And guess what? Over the summers, he used to come over to my house and I taught him networking. And he had a big career. So learn networking. It's a great place to get started. Yeah. And it's just the reason I recommend it is because it's just it's the most probably the most difficult Yes. And so if you can knock it out of the way over the course of two years when you're in high school, mm -hmm. not without the like the pressure and the demand of having to learn it, 
Um, then anything after that is just just icing on the cake. It is. Yeah, I couldn't. Oh, say I mean, that. he could. It, 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 he or she could easily, if they get networking down and then get the data center technology down. Everything after that is just icing on the cake. Yeah. They can have a six-figure yeah. job before they're twenty-one. And yeah, so. easy. They'll be waiting for you before you even graduate. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, all right. So we will be wrapping up soon, everybody. We've we've gone well over our one hour allotment of time. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> I just realized it. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Let's see. How long is the program? The program is a self-paced program for our basic regular cloud architect career development program. It's a self-paced curriculum that um, if it's if you're completely new, we, we see it takes on average six to eight. I was about to say the wrong thing. Six to eight months uh, for someone to be ready to uh, to, to start interviewing and, 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 and taking the jobs. Um, that's on average, you know, sometimes faster, sometimes longer. It just depends on the individual. Um, and it, it depends on what you're able to commit, uh, what your obligations are like, all, all of these things. We, we, we don't have a one size fits all. The 16 weeks is uh, 16 weeks, 20 weeks, whatever the, these arbitrary numbers that people throw out there for their, training programs it's just it doesn't work no um so we we have you in there for and, and then you've got access to the live classes for at least one year um you can after that one year period is up you can uh you can go month to month on the access to the live classes um and that's something that we address with the students as they as they uh, as their one year expires, but your access to the training materials, the training curriculum, the class recordings, all that stuff, that is, that is in perpetuity. <coughs> so, uh, uh, Barun says, I've been able to crack one of the solution architect roles, but unfortunately didn't join due to the location constraints. But you guys talked the exact skills one should have for architect. Hats off, you guys. We don't just make this stuff up. No. <laughs> so I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad that, that it's recognized. Uh, yeah. we, we really do appreciate that. And yeah. sometimes it feels like we're screaming in the void because there's so much, so much out there about certification, certification, certification. And we're the only ones, it seems like, that are like, Skills, 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 competency, 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 mm -hmm. communication, communication, communication. Yeah. You know, um, you've got to say that everyone wants that. Uh, I would, I dare to say that get rich quick scheme, if you will. And you have to do the work because you, you have to understand that they are willing to pay you upwards in the six figure realm in American dollars. And they want a return on their investment. I think people spend too much time thinking about what they're going to get instead of what the companies want in return. This is a transactional uh, situation. You are supposed to have the skill set to ultimately generate income, increase all sorts of branding initiatives, opportunities, and so forth. Your job is to move the company forward and you have to provide those skills. And those skills take time. And it's not something that you want to just mix and eat and microwave it into. You want to make sure your skills are solid and you're ready to go so that not only are you ready for that job, but you're ready to start doing the job on day one. Exactly. And that's why we teach these exact skills. I want everybody to get hired. I, I, I came out of retirement because I saw the people were trying to lie to people and say, here, just get these certifications and you're hired. I had a student that literally spent $35,000 to what's something he called level himself up. I don't even know what that means. And, uh, when he was done, he came to me and he asked, Mike, can you give me a practice interview and help me get hired? And he knew nothing. And he was a good kid. I mean, he took our program and six months later, he's at JP Morgan Chase as an elite architect. And, you know, I'm so proud of him. But the point is, is that's why we do what we do. I just want to get everybody hired. Yep, 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 yep. So, uh, Kumar Kumar says, can your program eventually pave path to an executive role? Not eventually. 
That's yeah. what the program is. Exactly. That that is a, that is what our program is. The architect role is an executive level role. Uh, the kind we train. A, it's not a C level role, but it, 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 so if you're asking about a C level role, yes, it can eventually lead to a C level role. But an executive or a leader role, the architect role, is that. Um, absolutely so so by all means and, and for anyone that's calling our, our number right now we will uh sorry we uh, haven't mentioned this previously but we will return calls after we get off the youtube <laughs> that's why some... that's why i said we got to get up here we've gone well over our one hour yeah <laughs> and, and that's a but, good point but but yeah any of these programs will get you in a, a can help you get to an executive role but that's why we really created the lead architect program on the how to make more money in tech program because we're teaching both the executive things and the architect things and because we want you to be in a position where you can get a cio role cto role th senior director roles within a couple of years experience of being an architect that's why we created these elite programs because that's our world how to get you to the top not just in the door right and i mean we've got just off the top of my head you know praveen uh took a vp role Yep. Uh, at JP Morgan Chase, we've got uh, we've got a lot of EP. name. I can't think of the right name, but he's an enterprise architect now. Angel um, is got cool. one, but yeah, yeah. we and Prit Paul is an enterprise architect now. We've got a lot of people executives right out of our basic program. It's twenty four ninety nine, but these new programs. Well, now we're talking some serious executive communications leadership. We even have th in those executive programs three coaches which are executive coaches that are doing interviews and tech leaders that are doing interviews to help that person eke out that extra fifty to $100,000 that's available to them. Yeah. All of our programs are, are, are amazing like that. All right. So that was our last question. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today on this uh, cloud computing career Q&A session. Uh, we do these regularly every week. So make sure you join us. And um, but before we go, I want to remind everybody about the free "How to Get Your First Cloud Job" webinar that's up in the up in the uh, up in the banner there. I'm going to put the link in the chat box again here one last time. And then I also want to share our LinkedIn uh, for Go Cloud Careers and for Mike. Make sure you're following us on both of those so that you know what's going on all the time. You don't want to miss out on anything that we've got going on. So I'm going to put those in the uh, chat box as well. So I look forward to seeing all of you or any of you on our webinar on Thursday, where you can ask us any questions. You can come off mute and ask us questions. You can, uh, you can engage with us one-on-one. -on -one. It'll be a great time as always. So, Mike or Alonzo, any last words? Yeah, one last word. So, you may have noticed I checked my phone about 10 minutes ago because it was buzzing, 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 buzzing. And here's the reason why. In about 10 minutes, I'm going to release a brand new article that, that just quoted me on LinkedIn. What happened was Data Center Magazine reached out to me for some comments on Friday. And they said, Mike, please talk about multi-cloud and cloud outages. And I gave them some comments. And literally speaking about 20 minutes ago, I was getting buzzed to say, Mike, you're in the media again. So follow me on LinkedIn. I'm going to release this. Check my LinkedIn photo on multi-cloud and why everything has to be multi-cloud and disaster recovery planning and all kinds of cool architecture stuff. It's going to come out in about 15 minutes to so follow me on LinkedIn and follow Go Cloud Careers. And one last thing, I really want to remind you, the only thing that holds 99% of the people back is the person themselves. Fear. Do not be afraid. If you don't take a chance, you've already failed. Yeah. Every shot you don't take, you missed. Invest in yourself. You know, when life we have to make decisions, do we go on the vacation or do we invest in ourselves? I'm going to tell you right now, invest in yourself. That's what successful people do. Believe in yourself. Successful people do this. And go after your dreams. I don't care what it is, but go after your dreams, whatever those dreams are. How about you, Alonzo? Absolutely, Mike. Um, definitely, my phone's been been buzzing off the hook. We, I will definitely, definitely answer everyone's phone call. I definitely want to correspond with everyone, get the most you can out of any questions about our cloud development architect programs, along with anything else that you have. We are here to help. I am excited to engage with everyone. Now, remember, if there's anyone else that are interested in, in getting a hold of their best cloud career ever, please have them join us um, our, on our prescribed times. 
And um, as usual, we are grateful and thankful for your time. And we are also always looking forward to just answering your questions so that you can start your cloud career today. Let's get going. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Take care, everyone.